Hello, and welcome to the September webinar presentation by the Underground Construction Association Young Members Group. My name is Colin Sessions, and I'm one of the members of the UCA of SME Standing Committee for Young Members. I am joined by Anthony Bauer, the Chair, Shannon Goff, the University Outreach Chair, Everett Litton, the Membership Chair, and Dimitrio Cruscolo, the Media Chair. The UCA Young Members Group is a standing committee of, of UCA of SME that consists of professionals of all ages who strive to attract and develop engineers and construction professionals 35 and under. Each month we put on a free webinar on various tunneling topics available to interested parties of all ages. Today, Charles, Han Charles Hanscat will be pre presenting an introduction to Shotcrete titled, Shotcrete Today, Not Your Father's Gunite. Charles is the Executive and Technical Director for the American Shotcrete Association. He is a licensed professional engineer and has been involved in the design, construction, evaluation, and repair of environmental, concrete, marine buildings, and shotcrete structures for over 40 years. He is an active voting or consulting member of many ACI technical and cert certification committees, including ACI 334, ACI 350, ACI 506, and C660. He is a board member of ACI Strategic Development Council and chairs the SDC TTAG Committee. He was also 2014 president of the American Shotcrete Association. Charles has been active in professional and technical engineering societies. He served as the president of the Florida Engineering Society and a national director for NSPE. He is a fellow member of ACI, ASCE, and FES and is an active member of ACI, ASA, ASCC, ARIMA, ASTM, and SDC. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Florida. Charles, thank you for presenting for us today, and when you're ready, please share your screen. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. All right. Do you see the screen now? Yep. Everything looks good. All right. Well, thank you, Colin, for the introduction and the invite to speak to you all about Shotcrete. Um, I have been involved in Shotcrete, gosh, somehow now it's been 40 years, and started off in dry mix, uh, shooting out in the field to build pre-stressed concrete tanks. Uh, but um, served within ASA as officer, um, as many of you are serving in SME or active in your, your UCA young members group within SME. So moving on to the presentation, this is our standard copyright material, which I understand this will be this being recorded. So this will be, uh, if anybody copies it, this is copyrighted material from ASA. ASA, American Shotcrete Association, our vision is that structures built or repaired with the shotcrete process are accepted as equal or superior to cast concrete. Cast concrete's been done for centuries and we have kind of a ramp to come up and be accepted as an equal uh, even though we have a lot of the same benefits as cast concrete and uh, actually superior benefits for sustainability and various things. Um, it, it takes time Uh, Charles, we seem to have lost your audio. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Strange, okay. <laughs> A cyber Tommy knocker. Yeah, because uh, the default is the microphone that I'm using with the headset. So, Anyway, jumping back into it, uh, is it can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, our vision, as you can see on the screen, the mission is ASA is to get the acceptance through training, qualification. We do certification in Nozleman. We're working on certification for Shotcrete inspectors uh, with ACI as well as at, uh, education, networking, leadership. Today we're going to talk about the definition of Shotcrete, the history of Shotcrete, uh, two different Shotcrete processes. Uh, a variety of applications. Now, the talk is not geared exclusively towards underground. Uh, maybe in the future you'd be interested. We do have an hour seminar that does uh, focus entirely on the underground market and design uh, specifications for underground shotcrete. 
Uh, but today it's more general application, giving you an introduction to Shotcrete. Going to talk about the benefits of Shotcrete in terms of sustainability, environmental conditions, formwork, um, quality assurance, Shotcrete application, finishing and curing, and then our nozzle and certification. I don't know how many of you have seen Shotcrete uh, going in place, but uh, this is a video. I'm not sure it, it may come across a little bit jerky uh, to you. But <clears throat> this is a mock-up panel that's done on a pre-construction mock-up for a project where the nozzleman is actually going to shoot the wet mix shotcrete in place um, and will be evaluated during the shooting process, but also after the concrete's hardened, uh, they'll core and make sure that they're getting the proper encasement that the engineer is looking for in the design. But things to note here, the, the concrete's being shot in place. There's no vibrator vibrating the concrete. The shotcrete, because of the high impact, is creating consolidation, compaction of the concrete in place. And its ability to stay vertical in a form without any uh, two-sided form to retain the concrete uh, gives us a lot of advantages because we have a very uh, light one-sided form that can define the surface and then the outer surface that you see here, the rough surface, can be finished to almost any kind of finish that we're looking for from this rough gun finish to a, a smooth trial finish or even carved rock, which you may have seen along some roadways and glues, things like that. Uh, but you can see the wet shotcrete going in place. Uh, the reinforcing bars are being fully encased by the wet concrete and uh, we're able to stack this material. This form is about eight inches deep with multiple uh, layer sizes of reinforcing steel, uh, fairly close spacing. Definition of shotcrete. It's really concrete placed by high velocity pneumatic projection from a nozzle. This is ACI's terminology. So it's not a separate material. It's a, simply a method of placing concrete. And I get questions all the time. Well, what's the fire resistance of shotcrete? Uh, what do I have to do for designing reinforcing for shotcrete? Well, it's the same as concrete. And because really all we're doing is placing concrete. Uh, because of the magnetic projection, high velocity, we don't need a lot of extra form work or vibration. The title of this talk was Shotcrete Today, Not Your Father's Gunite. Uh, Shotcrete actually started back in the early 1900s. Uh, Carl Akeley was a world famous taxidermist. He worked at the Field Museum in New York, I mean in uh, Chicago, also at a uh, Natural History Museum in New York. And in Chicago, he came up with the dual chamber uh, pressurized shotcrete system that allowed continuous feed of dry material through a hose and water to be added at the nozzle. First structural application was actually uh, repairing the facade of the Field Museum in Chicago uh, back in the early 1900s. You can see the photo in the lower right. Um, nozzleman with the nozzle, the hose conveying the dry material, water's added at the nozzle. Very similar to what we have today, except maybe not the fall protection. Uh, this may be very similar to a DOT job you see today because there's two guys working and a lot of guys standing around watching. And this is probably an inspector down here who looks really, really clean. Uh, those of you who may have uh, read the book uh, Path Between the Seas uh, about the building of the Panama Canal, Shotcrete was actually used to try to stabilize some of the slopes that they did in digging the original Panama Canal. You can see here in the back of this train car the uh, dual chamber pressure gun that allowed placing of the dry mix shotcrete. And here you can see they had a long hose uh, to the, the sites that they were placing the shotcrete to stabilize the slopes. Dual chamber gun here, you can see this is a refinement of that original design. And you can actually buy a gun that looks very similar to that dry mix gun that uh, is used extensively, not so much in the US or North America anymore, but uh, in South America and some other countries, a dry mix gun like this is still pretty popular. And here we are today. We have small rotary guns. Um, this allows, uh, it's much easier for the operator to run the gun. But we have basically a, a gun that takes the dry material, in this case it's bag material, that's dropped into the gun. 
it allows the air pressure to push the material, the dry material, through the hose. And then at the nozzle, we add water. So that was the first process, and we called it gunite. Gunite was the trade name from the cement gun company. Uh, when ACI and the American Railroad Association started writing standards, they didn't want to use a trade name, so they came up with the word shotcrete. And that's where we are today with the term shotcrete. But the original uh, term gunite is equivalent to what we have today with dry mix shotcrete. In the 50s, we saw introduction of the wet mix process. This is where concrete actually was mixed and then put into a pump. The pump pushes concrete through the hose, and then air is injected at the nozzle to give it the velocity. And in 1966, ACI uh, adopted that term shotcrete for both wet and dry ch shotcrete. The history, uh, you can see in the lower right, this is a kind of historical on-site kind of batch plant for producing wet mix. And here we are in the upper left, the uh, current technology, uh, very efficient shotcrete pumps that are designed for shooting uh, down, generally hand nozzlings, uh, an inch and a half to two inch hoses. Uh, some underground applications, two and a half, maybe even a three inch hose if you're using a remotely controlled uh, manipulator. Um, but pretty small operations in terms of what we need in equipment, and so very handy to get to remote sites or move between uh, areas where you're doing repair or new construction. So the two processes, the first, uh, which was originally called gunite, is where we take dry material, put it into, this is a rotary gun, drop it into the hose under pressure, uh, so the hose is full of a lot of air and a, a little bit of material, and then at the nozzle, we add the water. So this is a schematic showing the gun, the hose for material, uh, the water supply. It needs to be a high-pressure water supply so that the pressure exceeds the pressure of the air uh, from the flow of material. And um, then this is showing a, a pre-dampener. This is something uh, when you're using pre-bagged mixes, the bagged mixes are bone dry. If it wasn't dry in the bag, it'd be hard. Of a, half of it would be hard, like the bag of uh, Quickcrete that you might get at Home Depot to do your mailbox. But uh, we do like to see bag materials pre-dampened. It raises the moisture content to two or three percent to keep the dust down as it uh, enters the gun and also reduce wear in the gun. And this is a cross-section of a dry mix nozzle. We have the material hose here, so the flow is coming from the right-hand side to the left, comes through. We have a water body that's basically a metal ring with holes drilled in it that injects water at high pressure into the material stream. As the material stream comes through, we get turbulence. Uh, we have this Venturi effect where it uh, increases uh, in diameter, reduces the speed, and then re reduces in diameter, increases the speed along with roughness inside to produce turbulence because this is the first time that the concrete materials really see a significant amount of water and we're starting that hydration process here. And this is our this is a little batch plant if you think of it. Uh, here's a, a super sack, a 3,000, even sometimes a little more than 3,000 pound bag of dry material that is introduced into a pre-dampener. The pre-dampener dumps the material into a gun, and then the gun pushes it through the hose. And one of the things is dry mix, because we're using air, the hose isn't full of dry material, it's full of a lot of air conveying the material. We can go pretty uh, long distances, uh, several thousand feet is not uncommon uh, to achieve with dry mix. Uh, we're in wet mix when you're pumping through a hose and maybe steel pipe. Uh, tends to build up more friction, and so distances tend to be lower in wet mix. So the wet mix process, we are taking uh, pre-batched concrete, introducing it uh, into a typically a hydraulic cylinder pump, dual cylinders with a swing tube between that allow continuous flow of material through the hose where air is added at the nozzle. So the sch schematic's the same. We have a nozzleman with the nozzle, but he's adding air at the nozzle. And a concrete pump is either fed by a ready mix truck, uh, maybe site batched uh, with a concrete mobile, or in underground situations, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll batch it and mix it, as you can see, 
here the, a concrete mixer on site that actually dumps the material into the pump. And the shotcrete, uh, the wet mix nozzle is similar. We have material flow coming through. Uh, and here, instead of adding water, we're basically taking air, and the configuration allows us to produce the velocity. And when we talk high velocity, we're talking 60 to 80 miles per hour. So if you think about shotcrete, um, when we're talking high velocity, we are really producing a lot of impact. That's how we get consolidation full density of the material in place uh, and good encasement around reinforcing steel. I get a lot of questions, uh, well, should I specify dry mix or wet mix? It really depends. Wet mix is typically is about four times more productive, so four times more cubic yards could be shot per hour than dry mix. But if you're in a situation where you have to start and stop a lot, dry mix, because you don't have a, a truck full of concrete that's going to sit on you, um, it's much handier to, to use dry mix. And thinner, uh, smaller applications, dry mix may very well be a much more economical way than trying to, to do it wet mix. But it depends on the experience of the Shock Creek contractor, the equipment that they have available, the experience of the nozzleman. Because it is fundamentally different, uh, nozzleman for wet mix will be different experience than uh, nozzleman for dry mix. What are the applications we typically see for shotcrete? Uh, one of the big uh, things here in the northern part of the country, we use a lot of salt on the road. So parking garages, uh, bridge decks have a lot of salt, and the chlorides penetrate, uh, create corrosion that spalls concrete. And shotcrete, you can see here, a parking garage. Uh, it's an ideal application. We can basically chip back to sound material. Uh, shoot shotcrete in place. It'll hang overhead as well as you saw that vertical panel, but we, with silica fume and additives can shoot overhead, uh, can produce monolithic concrete in place uh, without any formwork. Another application that we've seen uh, ramp up recently has been building retrofits, so seismic retrofits on the west coast. Uh, also, historic structures where they want to be able to keep the outside look, and this, you can see just barely through this window that there is a uh, brick facade, but it doesn't meet the structural either wind or seismic code. So they come in and build a shotcrete wall in place that is the structural concrete wall that's going to hold that historic structure in place to meet the current building requirements. Uh, bridge retrofits, once again, a lot of chlorides. Uh, it might be also where you get wetting and drying, a bridge over a river or uh, exposed in marine environment uh, where you have aggressive conditions that will deteriorate concrete or cause corrosion. We can come in, uh, basically, once again, ship back to sound concrete material and shoot shotcrete in place and have it be probably stronger than what the original concrete was but because of the excellent bond, produce a monolithic section. Canals, aqueducts, um, once again, shotcrete is a very creative way of placing concrete. We're not constrained by flat surfaces, four by eight sheets of plywood. We can do curves very easily. And here you can see lining up the inside of uh, a water conveying tunnel. Uh, this is a canal. Uh, it's been used extensively for repair of corrugated metal pipe that was used as culverts under a lot of Charles, we have lost your audio. Is it still working? Now it is, yes. Was, how long was it cut off? About five seconds. OK. Yeah, it just it goes dead. So uh, sorry about that. I don't. It's showing that the microphone's working. but I know, and it shows as well here, but suddenly it, it, we just could not hear you. So please okay. proceed. All right. OK. Should I put the chat box up to see if you want to send me a message? No, no, okay. I don't think that would help. All right. We'll, we'll forge on. Sorry about that. But uh, one of the things, a lot of people think the shotcrete that, uh, you know, you're shooting a rough gun surface, it, it's not going to be conducive to smooth flow through pipes. With that final surface, we can actually finish it and get as smooth, if not a smoother finish, than what you often get with uh, cast concrete against forms. 
marine structures, once again, you have in a uh, marine environment exposure to salt water, and that creates corrosion in a lot of concrete, so we can come in and do repair. This is a lighthouse. It was actually up in the northwest part of Canada that had large tidal swings and concrete base and it was actually very efficiently done with shock creep because at low tide they could come in, shoot an accelerated shock creep, get it in place, uh, build up the, rebuild the section, and with accelerator get the strength before the tide came up. So a very efficient way to rebuild that concrete base. Uh, dams here, once again, you can see curved structures. We're placing quality, high quality concrete in place that's going to be durable. We can use fibers here. You can see they're using reinforcing steel. but uh, there's a big need for da dam rehabilitation uh, across the country, and we're seeing a lot of shock creep used there. And then here uh, for the underground ground support, um, there's a couple of different tunneling methods that have really evolved uh, using shock creep. And you can see in, in tunnels, they're not so concerned about appearance. This is a soil. There are a few soil nails going back. But it's about getting the structural shotcrete in place to hold up the uh, overburden on the tunnel, and uh, then they can move forward in mining or a tunnel, another tunneling application. Those of you who have been in a, a tunneling job often will see these uh, what they call robotic shotcreting. It's not programmed robotic. It's a remote re manipulator, basically, that uh, kind of joysticks that they can control the nozzle. Uh, we do recommend that nozzlemen that are using robotic have some experience in hand nozzling so they know the things, the visual clues to look for that are important for quality of shotcrete in place. Uh, underground, we tend to shoot thicker layers with accelerator and overhead, so it's safer if there is um, an instance where they shoot too thick and you have the shotcrete fall down that it's not going to hurt the robot too much, not as much as if a man was hand nozzling there. But uh, we shoot, you can see here, we're shooting mesh in. We shoot a variety of fibers. Uh, you can see the lattice girders here on a tunnel. Uh, pretty common on underground work. Uh, soil nails, this is an interesting application uh, where shockrate uses the structural skin between soil nails. And here they're building a retaining wall in place. They're starting at the top. They shoot the top six feet of wall. Uh, and then excavate the next six to eight feet, shoot the next six feet. So in effect, you're building a retaining wall from the top down, which if you were trying to build this wall in place with a conventional cast in place, you'd have to have two-sided forms, a lot more excavation, be much more inefficient. Another big application we're seeing is uh, basements, foundations for large structures where there's uh, zero lot lines or adjacent buildings. Uh, we can come in with shotcrete, once again, minimize excavation, uh, still get ex excellent quality uh, watertight concrete in place in the basements. And structural walls. And remember the picture back in the 20s, we were doing mainly soil support, then not heavily reinforced layers. We now commonly see walls 12, 24, even 36 inches thick with uh, reinforcing steel up to number 11 bars, uh, fairly closely spaced can be done uh, effectively and efficiently with shotcrete. And shotcrete has been used for some architectural. This is the Bing Concert Hall in Stanford University. You can see um, this, all the structure up here, the beige color, is actually shotcrete. It was really originally designed to have a cladding. Contractor came in and talked about the things that could be done with shotcrete, and the architect thought this was a great way to go. And this is actually the, the structure while it was under construction before it was painted. Another big application that you're probably familiar with for shock create is pools. Uh, a lot of pools now with infinity edges, uh, very tight tolerances on those uh, surfaces, uh, rounded radiuses, curves. Uh, we can do square things like the steps here on the lower right. but. Um, uh, Shotcrete allows the pool designer and contractor to, to do almost any kind of shape that they're looking for, and with a minimum of formwork, um, maximum of durability. This is where I started back in the 70s, building pre-stressed tanks. Tanks ranged in size from 100,000 gallons up to 30 million gallons of capacity. Uh, these were structures up to 350 feet in diameter, 70 feet tall all fully pre-stressed, and all the corrosion protection for the pre-stressing wires that were wrapped around the tanks 
uh, was done with shotcrete. And many of the tank builders actually used shotcrete for the entire construction of the wall. One of the things in a tank, a circular tank, you don't need as much thickness at the top as you do at the bottom because of the pre-stressing forces. And so it's easy to create a continuous taper in a wall with shotcrete. We're in a formed wall. Uh, getting a taper, it can be a distinct challenge because of the formwork. This is another application we've seen, storage domes. Uh, they're used for salt storage, cement, uh, dry bulk storage. Give you an idea of the scale. Here's a pickup truck down in the lower, um, lower portion of this slide. And uh, they basically have an inflatable plastic form that uh, they inflate, they shoot a foam layer on the underside to stabilize it, maybe two inches thick, and then they build the structural shell that's going to be the final structural support of shotcrete, layers of shotcrete in inside the shell. <clears throat> this is a uh, bobsled run. This is Lake Placid. Um, also, this shotcrete was used in the Vancouver Olympic uh, for their luge. Uh, bobsled sledding runs, and we just awarded an outstanding project to a sledding facility that's going to be in the South Korean Olympics coming up, uh, I think, next year or this winter. So people think, well, shotcrete, how do you maintain tolerances? Basically, we can shoot as long as we have that surface we can work with. We can control the tolerances, and we can get tolerances as fine, if not finer, than what you often see in cast-in-place work. Another application, a lot of curves. Shotcrete's a natural here. We can come in and get these nice, smooth curves. Skaters don't like to have a lot of um, irregularities in the concrete surface. So actually, skate parks tend to be a tight tolerance construction, as you would see in that uh, the bobsled Olympic runs. If you've been to zoos and other facilities, you may have seen some rocks and thought, well, how the heck did they get that rock in there? And, you know, with the elephants or the lions or whatever. And a lot of times it's not rock. It's shotcrete that's been uh, what I call shotcrete artisans that can come in, take the fresh shotcrete, color it, and make it look uh, exactly like um, natural rock. And in many cases, be more natural than the natural rock that would be uh, there. This is a tree that was done inside. I guess they decided they didn't want to water it. <laughs> and so there's, uh, this is one application. And then these lions were actually in Calgary, a bridge. Uh, the original structures had deteriorated. Uh, so the artist came in and carved these lions out of fresh shotcrete, uh, working with a shotcrete contractor. Shotcrete is sustainable, uh, has a lot more sustainability than many aspects of cast concrete. One thing, we reduce the formwork. Uh, our formwork is half. We're often shooting on just one one-sided form, and then many times there's no formwork at all. You saw the uh, structural repairs to bridges, uh, parking garages. We don't need formwork. We can shoot it and basically finish it to the existing uh, surfaces that are adjacent. Um, we can do efficient sections. I talked about tanks, how we could do a continuous taper. We can do curved sections. We can do dome-shaped, uh, double curve sections very efficiently. Uh, our equipment is fairly small. You saw the batching and uh, gun for the dry mix, very small uh, space footprint required. Uh, even wet mix has a pretty small footprint. Uh, you have the pump and the hoses. You got to get your ready mix truck in quite often or have a mixing facility. But a uh, fairly small com equipment requirement in comparison to what you often see on a big construction site where you might have a, a 36 meter or 42 or a uh, larger concrete pump come in. It's a massive truck. It needs a lot of room and uh, does take, uh, when you're building formwork, you end up having a lot of staging areas to build the forms that are needed for cast in place concrete. We often see time savings with shotcrete. Once again, if we can eliminate half the formwork or all the formwork, that's a big time savings, uh, though the placement process might be a little shorter. Uh, if you figure in the time savings from not having to build the form and strip the forms for double-sided forms, uh, we have a distinct advantage on time. Uh, also, in repair applications, because of that high velocity, we, in effect, are kind of sandblasting the surface as we expose it to the fresh cement paste, and so we get excellent bond of shotcrete to existing concrete. Uh, better bond, uh, higher strength material means that it's more durable. 
and we can do creative shapes. Anything the architect wants, uh, a lot of times we can do in Shotcrete very efficiently and effectively. Getting into the engineering side, uh, Shotcrete is basically concrete again. We're placing concrete. So we have to, in cold weather, have to meet the cold ACI 306 cold weather requirements. One thing that is a little bit different is we have a surface exposed. Just as if you would cast a floor, we generally have floor, uh, the walls or the underside of a deck exposed. And so we have a rule of thumb that when the temperature is 40 degrees and falling, you stop shooting unless you take protective measures. Uh, but I have shot shotcrete at uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you have to take precautions to heat the substrate and then protect the material very quickly. But uh, with that, you can uh, do cold, even colder weather than 40 degrees. But if it's not any special precautions, the 40 degrees and falling. <clears throat> and the way that works is that because of our very cement-rich uh, environment, we, we get the 500 PSI that's required to prevent concrete from freezing uh, and, and never gaining strength um, with the 40 degree limit. Hot weather <clears throat> may not be an, uh, a problem in underground shock creating, but uh, we do recommend that unless, uh, if you're shooting when temperatures are over 100 degrees, that you, you need to take some special precautions. Not only is it tough on the nozzleman, but uh, you get rap more rapid evaporation, you may get issues with craze cracking from early age plastic shrinkage cracks where you need to fog or mist. Uh, you may have to shade the surface. And once again, hot weather concreting of ACI 5, 305. Uh, if you're getting ready mix for wet mix, you may go ahead and get concrete delivered with ice in it. Uh, you may, if you're using dry mix, use cooled water. And because we have the exposed surfaces, uh, wind may be an issue where you're producing rapid evaporation that can cause early age plastic shrinkage cracks. Uh, once again, you uh, would want to probably get on and fog that surface to keep that evaporation rate down at the surface. The other thing we have with wind is if we have wind that's perpendicular to the material stream, it can tend to spread out that material stream and uh, not have uniformity of material in place. So, uh, large crosswinds uh, perpendicular to the material stream, uh, you may want to put up a protective barrier to keep that wind from affecting the stream. We don't shoot in rain. Uh, you don't shoot on ponded running water. Uh, in underground, sometimes you do have natural water coming out. Uh, there are times that you may shoot chakra just to kind of stabilize and reduce the flow, knowing that that's sacrificial, that you'll come in with a final chakra layer that's going to be your actual structural section. If you are doing repair work, uh, basically you're going to go back to sound concrete. You're going to make the surface be as clean as possible and then bring the surface to a saturated surface dry condition. That means that you filled the pores of the existing concrete. So when you shoot new shotcrete against it, it doesn't suck the water out of the paste and tend to reduce the bond. <clears throat> We don't use bonding agents in shotcrete, number one. You're impacting at 60 to 80 miles an hour. Sandblasting, you're going to many times just knock that bonding agent off. And we have had issues where the bonding agent is outside its open window. It can serve more as a bond breaker. But uh, because of our velocity of impact, the proper surface prep, the high paste content, we get excellent bond of shotcrete to existing concrete structures. Formwork, I uh, mentioned before, often uh, one-sided forms that can be significantly lighter, where if I'm doing a 20-foot wall uh, cast in place, I might be using three-quarter inch plywood with uh, whalers and stiff backs, ties through, uh, where if I'm doing that in shotcrete, I might be able to just put up a light quarter inch plywood, or even I've seen masonite and pegboard used as the outside form. All we're doing is defining the surface. Uh, for the shotcrete to be placed against. And once again, we can do curved or tapered sections very easily. So this just gives you an idea. Uh, if you do have a project where you can easily get to both sides and it's a large wall going to take a lot of concrete, maybe maybe it would be more effective for uh, considering cast in place. Uh, with shotcrete, if you have tight uh, excavation requirements, if you have radiuses, constricted spaces, 
uh, we have a natural advantage. Reinforcement, I mentioned before, it's the same reinforcement as any concrete design. You know, one difference, we do recommend non-contact lap splices. If you think about a lap splice of the reinforcing steel, it then in effect uh, doubles the area that we're trying to get the shockrete to wrap around the bar. So if we can separate the bars, we're then just encasing individual bars. It's easier to encase and, and get the proper encasement, full encasement of the bar. And we can also do multiple layers. I've seen uh, two foot thick sections where there was heavy steel in both an, an inside layer and an outside layer where the inside layer would be erected and shot in and then shot out to where the outside layer, place the reinforcing, shoot the next layer and out to the finished surface. With shotcrete, uh, because we can shoot in multiple layers, we can be creative on how we create some of these sections. Alignment control, you saw the, the uh, skate parts, the luge run, we can meet very tight tolerances. Pretty common to use shooting wires or ground wires. These are just high strength wires that establish, in this case, the corner of a wall. And they shot creep to that wire, cut the material to that wire. We know that we have the proper cover over the reinforcing steel. Here you can see a radius down at the bottom where they're going to cut that shot creep in place. And shotcrete's one of the most sophisticated users of concrete uh, out there today. We use super excuse me, super plasticizers to get a very low water cement ratio. Uh, water cement ratios are typically from a 0.3 to about a 0.42 with a wet mix. A dry mix tends to have a lower water cement ratio. But we use alkali-free accelerators. These are rapid set accelerators, allow us to get strength very, very early with a matter of Uh, Charles, we've lost you again. Can you hear me now? I now I can. Yeah. Now we can. Good. All Thank right. you. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure why, why that's happening, but... I, um, I don't know either. I, I can't see anything from this end, so it's got yeah. to be sunspots or cyber yeah, time. It's or the something. internet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're getting our windows washed at the office here. I think that's it. That's um, what it is. <laughs> But we use alkali free accelerators, give you the rapid set of material so we get high early strength. Uh, we use microsilica, silica fume. Uh, hydration control is very popular uh, for controlling the set time. Where typical concrete, you have to use it within 90 minutes. Uh, we can go from three hours to actually three days uh, with a lot of the hydration control. We use steel fibers, uh, we use control. Uh, corrosion inhibitors, air and training admixtures. So almost everything you have in concrete, uh, we, we do and often do regularly in shotcrete, uh, concrete use for shotcreting. Typical concrete mix is showing fibers, steel, water cement ratio 0.3 to 0 0.45. 0 0.45 would actually be a pretty high water cement ratio for a wet mix. Uh, typically I see 0.42 and less. Um, we use uh, a smaller aggregate. We typically will have a 3 8 inch maximum aggregate size. Uh, that's because if, we were, if we're using an inch and a half hose and we're trying to shoot with an inch aggregate, it's a much more prevalent uh, our possibility to plug the line. So we use a smaller aggregate. And actually, I'm seeing a lot of cast in place work now where because of the level of reinforcing steel, you can't use a, an inch and a half aggregate anymore. You, you're down to three quarter inch or even three eight speed gravel mixes just to encase reinforcing steel. Um, so we have uh, ACI and ASTM C33 have two different gradations. One is the just fine aggregate that's a quarter inch and less, mostly sand. And then two, that's a three eighths inch and uh, fine aggregate. We use almost all the SCMs. Silica fume is very common. Uh, fly ash is very common. Silica fume uh, improves the adhesion and cohesion of the material. So if we're shooting overhead, silica fume helps it stick better, also helps you build a thicker layer. Um, fly ash can help to uh, resist uh, a, uh, some low levels of ASR alkali silica reactivity in the concrete materials. Uh, also, Silica fume, fly ash, and slag all reduce the permeability, which improves the durability. And actually, fly ash and slag uh, can tend to increase the, the long-term strength. Uh, and, and actually, silica fume, both, all three will increase the, the strength of concrete long-term. 
Air and training admixtures uh, are very common in wet mix. Uh, we do have them also in dry bagged uh, mixes for dry mix. Uh, air and training makes these little bubbles. This is actually sand particles. You see here, it looks like aggregate. This is small uh, bubbles. These are on the right, uh, non-air and train. These are large and trapped air bubbles. With shock rate, we tend to, because of that 60 to 80 mile per hour impact, we lose air content. But the air content we lose tends to be the larger and trapped air bubbles that aren't effective for freeze thaw, and we retain the smaller bubbles. So when you do an air void analysis, you'll find that shockrete actually is, is very durable, though the total air contents may be less than what you get in cast concrete. Uh, we do use set accelerators. A lot of underground work will have a set accelerator so we can do thicker applications. Uh, we're not so concerned about the uh, final appearance and the total thickness, um, but we can substantially reduce the set time. And the thing with accelerator, when you are using it, it, you have to be careful that you precisely dose the material. Too much accelerator will substantially reduce the strength. Even properly dosed, accelerated concrete will tend to be lower strength long term than what you would get non-accelerated. So you're getting the advantage of early strength, but you don't have the necessarily the full long-term strength. <clears throat> fiber reinforcing, we use um, uh, both synthetic fibers and steel fibers. Steel fibers are typically used in mining, uh, underground applications where you're looking for flexural toughness, impact resistance, ductility. Uh, they tend to be heavier. One thing to note, if you are shooting with steel fiber, you shouldn't be shooting uh, steel fiber or shotcrete on top of wire mesh. It tends to build up at the intersections and create a potential for voids. Uh, so we don't recommend steel fiber when using wire mesh. But we are seeing more and more synthetic fibers uh, coming into play, microfibers. A lot of contractors use it just as a matter of course because it helps to reduce the potential for early age plastic shrinkage cracks. Those are the uh, cracks that form from rapid evaporation of the surface while it's plastic. Uh, and in structural applications, uh, in substitution for steel, we are seeing the macro fibers. These are a uh, little bit bigger diameter, uh, over 12 mils, longer fibers. Uh, there's a variety of different manufacturers with different configurations, but uh, they are becoming accepted in the underground industry. And uh, actually, some people think the ductility that they produce uh, provides better performance uh, than some of the steel fibers. Hydration control, we already talked about a little bit, but allows us to stretch out the time. If we're on a project and we have to move from one place to the other, uh, often we can't, we can't use the concrete within 90 minutes. And so hydration stabilizers, hydration control become very popular. If you're doing a, a construction job with a very heavy reinforcing, uh, it's recommended to do pre-construction mock-up panels. You can see here in the lower left, uh, this is uh, very heavily reinforced. This will be a section that shot created. Here's uh, after that was shot, actually sawed so the engineer could inspect and see the encasement of the reinforcing steel. But that shows that the material selection, the equipment, and the nozzleman are actually qualified to shoot the particular reinforcing uh, configuration on that project. Quality assurance, QC, uh, plastic shock crates, very similar to cast concrete. Uh, we can do uh, air, the, how long has it been since it saw water, the temperature, setting time. Uh, finish intolerances can be established um, while it's still plastic. Um, reinforcing encapsulation, you actually, a good inspector, a good nozzleman can watch the shock crate going in place and verify just visually that you're getting full encapsulation of the reinforcing. Hardened shock rate, compressive strength. We don't shoot into cylinders. Cylinders, if you think of it, it's a closed cylinder. When we shoot into that, there's a lot of air, and that air gets trapped in the cylinder, where if we're shooting in a wall or a panel, uh, that air can escape. So we typically, uh, for compressive strength, test from panels that are shock created. Uh, so that's the actual material that's shock created into the panel. Uh, it's not just as delivered out of the truck. It's as, as shot in place. Uh, we can do flexural strength from beams, circular panels for toughness in the underground market. You may have seen those. 
And you can do some permeability tests, uh, boil water absorption, or we're also seeing rapid chloride penetration and surface resistivity. Good practices, uh, we're shooting at 60 to 80 miles an hour, but we also want to get maximum impact in place. So we shoot at 90 degrees to the receiving surface. Uh, here we're showing that you shoot your corners first because as it hits, you tend to get some rebound that would accumulate in corners. So you shoot the corner first with good material and then you shoot the middle and then the, uh, or the edges and then the middle. And this is a picture of good shotcrete encasement. You can see the reinforcing deformation, the deformations on the reinforcing bar as it's actually being embedded in the shotcrete. And there's no voids back behind. So good, solid, monolithic material. Finishes we can do anywhere from the gun finish. It looks a little bit like the craters of the moon up here, kind of rough, uneven thickness, down to carving. Uh, from least expensive gun finish to the most expensive carved. <coughs> this is the most uh, common is a, a rod finish where you have a surface uh, maybe with shooting wires that you can cut to. Gives you a, a consistent thickness, maybe a little rough. A lot of times they'll come back and float this finish. Uh, so a float finish, a sponge finish, actually looks very similar to what you may get in uh, inside your your home in a plaster wall. Fairly smooth, but not a, and, and we can do a smooth steel trowel finish. We don't recommend it uh, because steel troweling brings water to the surface to get that gloss, which means a higher water cement ratio, less durability right at that surface. Also tends to show cracks more. But we can do curved sections with no problem. Uh, we can blend in, uh, so you can see here the radius uh, of these columns are an exact match. One thing we can't match is color. Uh, if you, there is a concern about color, we recommend coming in with a, a coating, maybe a cementitious coating that doesn't need maintenance so you can get a consistent color. Rockscapes, once again, uh, shot Crete artisans here. This is pretty straightforward. They've shot it and they have some rough carving, not a whole lot of work, uh, not working on extra coloring there. But uh, you may drive along uh, a lot of the highways now have retaining walls or shot crete that they make to, to look like rock walls like this. It is concrete when we shoot it. It has an exposed face, so it has to be cured. And we recommend that it, uh, in hot, dry, windy conditions, certainly, but uh, in, in many instances, fogging or misting, just a, a normal course of action to keep the surface from drying out and getting early age plastic shrinkage cracks. Uh, ideal is water curing. Uh, sometimes you're doing overhead, you can't uh, water cure. So we do recommend uh, using a curing compound, but applying it at twice the rate so we get a good seal. Because if you're curing with a curing compound, the only thing that's providing water for hydration is what was originally in the mix. We already talked about the fact that it's a low water cement ratio, so that uh, means that there's less water in there to hydrate. So always better to give it water if you can't put on curing compound at twice the rate. Nozzleman certification. Um, the nozzleman is the front lines of the shot creek placement. He's the one that sees every square foot of shot creek going in place. He knows whether he's got the proper velocity, the proper angle, consistency of material. So we do have a certification program. ASA is the sponsoring group that uh, runs all of ACI's nozzleman certification work. And a certified nozzleman has to have a minimum of 500 hours of experience on the nozzle. He has to attend a one day, full day education that ASA puts on, uh, similar to this one hour session, but we go for a day and give them a lot more details on placement and materials. Uh, they take a written exam, they have an oral exam about safety, and then they are actually um, graded for placement and the ability to encase reinforcing bars in a performance panel. And this is what the panel looks like. It's uh, three and a half inches deep, 30 inches square, and we have a number four bar, a number six bar, a number eight bar, and then two number four bars parallel, fairly short, uh, tight together. They're um, an inch and a half apart. And so we will grade the nozzleman while he's shooting the panel. Uh, the certification is in both the process, so they'll be certified either for wet mix or dry mix, or they can do both, and then the orientation, vertical or overhead. 
Uh, vertical, always, they have to always do vertical and they can add on the overhead. But uh, after they've shot the next day, we come in and core the panel and grade those cores on the um, ability of that nozzleman to en encase that reinforcing. So if you think, you know, just aiming the nozzle at the wall and saying, hey, you know, that's going to be good shock rate. On the right here is a concrete core and um, on the done by an experienced nozzleman. The one on the left is a, a new nozzleman, just picked up the nozzle. You can see not using the right uh, technique, not uh, the right distance from the, the surface, uh, much more porous material in place. So it is important uh, to get your certified nozzleman. References for shockcrete, uh, two of the best are the 506R-16, that's an ACI document. Uh, 16 is the year designation, so it was just updated last year. It's the guide to shockcrete. This is a non-mandatory document that explains a lot of the ins and outs of shockcrete, the shockcrete uh, crew members, uh, things to look for uh, from shooting uh, by the nozzleman, uh, material selection, equipment selection. And then the 506.2-13 is the specification for shockcrete. We actually have aligned the two. If you look at the specification, it's very terse, concise requirements for the contractor and mandatory language. Uh, if you go into, say, paragraph 3.1.2 of the spec, uh, you can go into 3.1.2 of the guide and it'll actually provide a commentary of what's in the specification. There also is a uh, ACI 506.5 uh, document that is a guide for specifying underground shockcrete. We actually have a full hour underground uh, presentation that uh, goes into this uh, guide for specifying underground shockcrete and um, that's something that ASA offers as a either a uh, on-site seminar or maybe something you all are interested in in the future uh, as a webinar. So shockcrete.org is always the first line of, not defense, but uh, resources for finding info the, uh, about shockcrete certification, acicertification.org. And um, then you can always, I always answer technical inquiries. There's my phone number and the uh, email address. If you want to shoot me an email, I can respond to any questions you may have. And I. Don't know if we have any questions today. Thank you, Charles. We would like to open up the um, uh, the board for questions. Please ask your questions via the the chat panel. And our first question, Charles, is what shotcrete mix would you use on frozen ground? Uh, you're not going to shoot on frozen ground because it's going to freeze that paste interface. Um, you, if, if it's frozen ground, you're going to be cold weather concreting. The materials need to be 50 degrees. What you may do is shoot a uh, stabilizing layer that you know is going to be sacrificial because that interface is going to freeze and you're not going to get strength in that concrete. So you should not be shooting on frozen ground. Um, but you can shoot a sacrificial layer uh, knowing that that will kind of give you a, a surface that you can build your main thickness out to. Good. Thank you. The next one is a combination uh, comment and question. Pamela says, this was a comprehensive presentation. Thank you. Can you explain the difference between shotcrete and PAC pneumatically applied <laughs> concrete used in New York? She asks, is the velocity the same for PAC? PAC is, was the, uh, one of the original terms used, uh, actually there was an ACI document, uh, pneumatically applied concrete, PAC. Um, originally, 1907, you saw the slide, we were doing shockcrete, it's always been high velocity, but uh, over the span of years, there have been alternate systems that use low velocity, low ver velocity sprayed mortar. And that also kind of falls under the terminology of pneumatically applied concrete because it is pneumatically applied, but it's the real designation, the difference in designation between shockcrete and low velocity mortar is the velocity. And once again, we, we need that velocity to get consolidation, compaction of the material in place, uh, full encasement of the bars, which with low velocity is tough to do. 
I think uh, what you're specifically referring to in New York, I, we're seeing very heavily reinforced sections where we can't get full encasement of the bar because there's a lot of reinforcing or obstructions before that chakri can get to the back layer of reinforcing. So in those cases, they may come in and actually uh, place, using a chakri nozzle, shoot the concrete in place, but then maybe use a pencil vibrator to provide supplemental compaction, knowing that they're not getting the velocity that they need for full compaction. So it's, I wrote an article about it. If you want to go to shockcrete.org, you can search for uh, pneumatically applied concrete, a confusion of terms. I, I kind of go through the history and where we're at today. Thank you. The next question is, what is the recommended shooting distance from the nozzle to the form? Usually a nozzleman is going to be about three feet away from the receiving surface. Um, now, if he has an air compressor that's not putting out quite the air that he feels he needs, he might get in closer. Um, if he's got a very long, like if you get in an underground, you may have a very long nozzle that uh, provides almost like a, a, not a rifling effect, but kind of like the difference between a sniper rifle and a, a shotgun. Uh, so they may actually get further away in underground, but in hand nozzling, typically you'll see nozzlemen be roughly three feet away from the receiving surface. Thank you. The next question is what impact force per in maximum is seen when shooting? The impact force, it's very localized. It um, once again depends on whether you're shooting uh, the distance that you're away from the form. Um, we don't have a firm like pounds per square foot that is, uh, we have to have the form work stable enough so it doesn't vibrate as we're shooting against it, but it doesn't take, a, you know, we're not talking hundreds of pounds per square foot. It tends to be very localized because we, we just are impacting right where the material stream is hitting. So um, I don't have a specific pounds per square foot and it, it would be considered like a point load rather than a distributed force like you would design for in a cast in place form. Very good. The next question is when should we specify flexural strength versus toughness? Actually the two are kind of related. Um, it's usually the choice of the designer of the under of the tunnel. Um, if, if they're looking for flexural strength or toughness uh, the test for toughness is the round panel test. That's the most common, uh, but often it's done with the flexural beam test too. I think both of them really talk about the ability of that section to take structural bending. Toughness is maybe more a, a point load type of uh, approach uh, or concept uh, rather than flexural is more like a, a beam bending type of approach. Thank you. The next question is, what is the recommended maximum aggregate size for shotcrete? It does depend on the size of the hose. The uh, maximum aggregate size should be one third the diameter of the hose. So if I'm shooting with an inch and a half hose, we would typically use a half inch aggregate. If you're shooting with a two inch, you may be able to go up to three quarter. Um, Underground, if you have a two, two and a half inch nozzle, you may be able to certainly use three quarter, maybe even a little bigger. Depends on pumpability, depends on you know the, the regularity of your aggregate. Uh, if it's really coarse, angular rock, it, it may not pump as easily. So, um, but we look at it in relation, one third the diameter of the hose would be what we would recommend as the maximum coarse aggregate size. Thank you. We, we do have time for a couple more questions. Okay. The next one is, what do you recommend for drainage behind shotcrete from rock surface in an overhead application? Uh, there are some drainage materials that you can put up and shoot on that would then allow drainage to go back. Be, you know, basically, you'd be draining it down somewhere where you could convey it away. Um, 
I'm not an expert in underground to be able to, to give you a, a universal answer. Uh, I have worked in, uh, say, concrete tanks where uh, we actually tried to stop the flow of water maybe with a water plug or what I mentioned before, a sacrificial layer, shotcrete, to slow it down enough to where we could then shoot the uh, structural shotcrete section. Very good. Our final question, is there guidance on setup strength of shotcrete? He's looking for an engineered approach to the, quote, exclusion zone. I'm not sure of the exclusion zone. It's probably an underground uh, term. <laughs> the uh, setting, setting of shotcrete uh, with accelerator, which in underground a lot of times with accelerator, will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer and the dosage. So it might be something that you'd need to uh, check with the manufacturer. The other is that you know concrete mixes vary according to where you're at. The cement supplies are different aggregates so uh, often it may be something that you want to actually produce the concrete mix and shoot it and see what your set times are. Uh, there are some tests that you can do for concrete uh, calorimetry that can give you some idea of set time uh, but I am personally not familiar how well they may model use of accelerator if you're using a, an accelerated mix. So I don't I don't have a full answer, but that's about the best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. All right. Uh, a final comment. Gregory wants to know how he can get a, get a copy of the presentation. Uh, Gregory and everyone else, this presentation has been recorded, and it will be rendered and made available on the SME UCA website within about 48 hours. So please, uh, please check back on the, there is an entire list of the UCA Young Members webinars from the past uh, several years available to you. And that uh, we have run out of time. Charles, would you have any final comments for our attendees? Well, uh, tell that. Uh, Gregory, that if he wants to shoot me an email, my email address is up there and I can provide a PDF of the presentation. Good, thank you. That's all I got. I appreciate your time and uh, at least those on the East Coast spending lunch with us. And uh, feel free once again to contact me by email or phone if you have any questions about Shotcrete. I may not know the answer, but I probably will be able to tell you or refer you to somebody that does. Great, thank you. It was a fascinating presentation. I have right. a wonderful afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This, this ends today's session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.